Hello once again and welcome to our next module here in the class. And in this class, uh, module, what I want to focus on is let's take a closer look at the issue of uh, communities and the impact that the changes in the modern American food system have had on communities and how food uh, basically shapes our communities and our relationships uh, with other people. Now obviously this is something that uh, was a fairly significant focus in Conkin's book on the revolution in American agriculture. One of the main uh, things that he points out in that book is how the consolidation and modernization of American agriculture during the 20th century led to uh, a decreased need for human labor in the agricultural system, which led to uh, farms getting bigger and bigger with fewer and fewer people working on them, which in turn leads to the decline of uh, rural communities, and you end up with uh, tens of thousands of people who had been working in agriculture and as farmers uh, moving to the cities and entering in, uh, different industries. And so there's been a lot of talk about the loss of rural communities um, and the impact that that's had on the country, and so that was something I wanted to focus on uh, a little bit in this module. So basically, uh, what I want to do here is to just give us uh, essentially an introduction uh, to two other readings on this topic that I would like you to uh, read through uh, for the module. And the reading is a little more than usual, so I will try to keep uh, the module a bit briefer than usual. Uh, and also, I think uh, that the two readings, one a chapter from uh, Wurzba in our textbook and another an essay by uh, the author Wendell Berry, both make their points very eloquently and well and do a better job of making those points than I could here in the module. So I'd rather have you spend your time uh, reading them and thinking about them and then discussing them on Blackboard. Uh, so we will keep uh, our module time brief here. But again, uh, I did just want to point out that this is a, a significant issue in America today, that there has been a real transformation in the American way of life. Uh, if you look specifically at Kansas, for example, uh, three quarters of the counties in the state lost population over the past 10 years, according to the census. Uh, we've seen, I think, references before about how uh, at least one in four Americans eats fast food every day, uh, which tends not to be sort of communal eating where you're spending a lot of quality time with other people. 58% uh, of Americans regularly eat alone. Each year, uh, on a sort of uh, larger time scale, I suppose, as opposed to looking at individual meals, I've also been struck by this uh, other statistic I came across recently, uh, that each year there's 40 million Americans who move, which is a significant uh, percentage of our population. Uh, and the average American is going to move 14 times in his or her life. Now, obviously, that's only an average, and so there's going to be some people even significantly more times than that in their life. Why is all of this matter? Why are we talking about this in a theology slash ethics slash food course? Uh, well, I think the reasons are uh, obvious. We think back to some of our very first a couple of modules, our very first readings. Uh, one of the things that we really emphasized there was the importance of relationships in the Catholic worldview and in a Christian worldview. Relationships aren't just something that make our lives better, but we can do without them uh, in exchange for other things. We are, by our very nature, relational creatures. Uh, we are made to relate to other people, uh, and to a lesser but real extent, we are made to be in relationship with uh, the land around us and other uh, animals and plants uh, in the surrounding community. When we lose those things, uh, we lose uh, an important aspect of our human nature, uh, and that human beings can't develop the way they were meant to develop in isolation. Now, obviously, most Americans aren't living in isolation, but we are living with uh, really reduced sorts of relationships, the relationships where we don't spend a great deal of time with other people, relationships that are uh, necessarily cut short by moving frequently for a new job or a new promotion or perhaps a layoff uh, and a need to move somewhere. And obviously, uh, no one uh, of these factors is somehow immoral. It's not necessarily immoral to move 
to find a better job or to accept a promotion. But when we look at the sum total effect uh, of all of these moves, of all of this focus on choosing uh, a fast meal alone at McDonald's so I can get more work done versus a slower meal uh, with family or even with coworkers, over time, those individual choices build up into a system where people's relationships are diminished, and as a result, that has a real impact on the development of our nature as human beings. So I think these are significant issues, and of course, all of this is tied in with our food system as well. It's the modern American food system that makes it possible for so many people to lead uh, these transitory lives where there's no real connection to a uh, local environment. There's no real... Uh, connections to extended family or friends, because that's no longer necessary on the most basic level to have our food provided for us. It can all be shipped anywhere in the world at any time, uh, and we can consume it whenever we would like as well. We don't even have to take the time uh, to cook. And so all of these things uh, mix together to yield the modern American lifestyle and the modern American food system. Uh, and while certainly most of us are going to see convenience and, and low cost as real benefits of the system, uh, I think thinking about its impact on relationships and the broader impact on communities is an important part of thinking about uh, the modern American food system and what some critiques of it might be. Uh, and so to do that, like I said, I want to focus here on two uh, readings for you in this module. Uh, first, I want to take a look at uh, Wurzba's chapter, and then we'll also introduce uh, an essay by Wendell Berry, uh, and then we will wrap things up. Where's this chapter on uh, Eucharistic table manners uh, brings together and expands upon a number of ideas that we've seen in the other chapters that we've read from him so far. But obviously in this chapter he's going to focus in a specific way on this idea of uh, the Eucharistic table. Uh, and for those of you who don't have a lot of background in Christianity, uh, the Eucharist is really kind of the central uh, component of Catholic Christianity and Catholic worship. Um, it involves, as Catholics, we believe it's where uh, the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus, uh, and we receive them in communion. Uh, other Christian traditions have a different understanding of what goes on there. Uh, for most Protestants, uh, Jesus doesn't really become kind of literally present in the bread and wine so much as the bread and wine serve as a symbol of Jesus uh, that calls us to reflect on uh, what he did for us, the sacrifice on the cross, and how he brings us together as Christians. But if you study uh, church history, you'll see that while Christians certainly argue about a great many things, um, and certainly disagree about exactly how we're supposed to understand uh, this ritual, which Catholics call Eucharist, and which Protestants will call the Lord's Supper or Communion. Uh, one of the striking things is that basically all of the major uh, traditions within Christianity uh, maintain this ritual, right? This practice of uh, sharing bread and wine as part of their worship. And of course, there's a reason for this. It stretches all the way back uh, to Jesus himself in the Gospels, where he shares his Last Supper uh, with his disciples, uh, and he tells them to continue to do the same thing uh, until he comes again. And so the vast majority of Christians have continued to do that, have continued to uh, incorporate this ritual meal into their worship in, in varying ways. Uh, and in this chapter, what Wurzb is doing is, is focusing on this idea, uh, and he's calling us to pay attention to it in a new way. Uh, for many Christians, this just becomes uh, kind of a ritual that you go through without really uh, thinking about it. And even for those people uh, who really do kind of reflect on this as a significant part of their faith, uh, it tends to become spiritualized, right? We tend to think of it in terms of uh, this is about me connecting with, with God. This is about me connecting with Jesus. This is a chance for kind of personal reflection on my spiritual life. Uh, and what Wurzba is doing in this chapter is, is forcing our attention back to um, what this really is, that this is really a shared meal. And if we read in the New Testament about what this was like, uh, we can see it was, in fact, a very much a real concrete meal that Christians shared. Uh, when Paul writes to the different churches that he 
uh, founded in his New Testament letters, he will criticize them uh, for their behavior, or misbehavior rather, uh, in sharing this meal together. And he's very critical of the Christians in the city of Corinth for not uh, properly uh, being united in this meal, by having uh, divisions between them, uh, and eating it in a way that divides people rather than unites them. Uh, we can read in the book of Acts about how the early apostles uh, really kind of pooled the resources of the Christian community as a whole and would really, uh, everyone would sell what they had and give to the common, uh, common account, and then food and clothes would be provided. It was really communal living that was then centered on uh, this practice of sharing this meal. Uh, and so this is really an essential part of the Christian faith that's very important in the New Testament. Uh, and it really was, in fact, originally a actual meal that people would share together. And so Wurzba is going to highlight the importance of this and argue that um, Christianity is uh, very much about this. It's about bringing real, physical, concrete people together uh, with each other, forming a, a local community where you have real connections uh, between people. And this is not just something we do occasionally if a potluck comes up that this ought to be kind of a defining feature uh, of the Christian faith. But of course, as Christians, uh, I think all Christians believe this is more than just an ordinary meal, right? Whether it's a Protestant belief in a kind of symbolic or spiritual presence, or whether it's a Catholic belief in the real presence of Jesus, this is uh, a meal where people are brought together in a more profound way than just your typical meal, uh, and that we are really... Uh, entering into our life with Christ in a special way. Again, if you read uh, the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul talks about this a great deal, and Wurzba talks about it uh, in his chapter. And when we read Paul in 1 Corinthians, he really uh, says that the Christians who share in this meal are really united with Christ. Right? And this isn't just kind of a, an abstract unity, that you are really kind of uh, essentially united to Christ uh, in a very profound way. Uh, and even uh, talks about it in ways that are uh, analogous to the union between, say, husband and wife uh, in a sexual relationship, where there's a real kind of bodily union between them. Obviously, there are differences here, but this union between uh, Christian and Christ in uh, the Eucharist and in entering into and receiving the body of Christ in this meal uh, is understood in a very similar way. That this is a real, even almost physical, connection between the Christian and Christ. And of course, what happens as a result of that is if that individual Christians are profoundly, really united with Christ, uh, that's going to mean that they are also, through that, united with uh, each other. And so for Paul, when we read his letter, and we read the other New Testament uh, books as well, uh, these churches aren't just clubs. This isn't just some uh, interesting spiritual group that you decide to go to because uh, it kind of meets your needs at the moment or you find it entertaining. Right? That this is really entering into a very profound, very life-changing set of relationships. Relationship uh, with Jesus and God, certainly, but also real, concrete, life-changing relationships with your fellow Christians in that concrete local community. And so what Wurzba is uh, arguing for here in the chapter is that if Christians take seriously uh, what is going on in terms of our connection with Jesus in this meal, uh, then we need to take equally seriously the connections that we ought to have with other people uh, that we share meals with. And that a Christian should be, Christian life should be uh, more or less defined by this sort of communal sharing of meals uh, that in some ways, you could view the church potluck as not just kind of an additional part of uh, church practice that people think is kind of fun, so they do it. But that's really what the church ought to be about, about uniting people, sharing food, uh, sharing uh, companionship, building relationships. Uh, and that's what Christianity really needs to be. And of course, those relationships are going to be like the relationships that God has with his people. They're going to be sacrificial. They're going to be loving. Uh, and they're going to be committed, right? And you can't have those sorts of intense, profound relationships 
uh, if you are moving every couple of years, uh, that you need to make real commitments to have meaningful uh, relationships. And so I think this is a very uh, provocative chapter, really. And if this is right, if this is what Christianity really ought to be about, about real concrete connections with people over shared food that makes real uh, essential differences in our lives, that's going to mean perhaps that Christians need to think about, um, do we need to have a very specific commitment to staying in a local community, uh, staying in a particular church, a particular town, for the long term, in order to be uh, truly and properly Christian? Uh, I think it's an interesting question. And certainly this is not aimed at any particular other Christian group. Catholics are notorious uh, for doing a little parish shopping if they don't have to like the priest in their parish at a time, well, they'll go somewhere else. Uh, and I think if you were to take words but seriously here, he would be very critical of that. This would also then ask questions about moving for a better job or uh, moving for a better school district. Uh, is that really compatible with this vision of the Christian life? So I want you to read the chapter yourself uh, and then I'll ask you for your thoughts on it uh, on the discussion board. But I thought it might be helpful to at least introduce some of these ideas uh, before you dive into the words about uh, on your own. The other reading that I want you to take a look at for this module is an essay by uh, the author Wendell Berry. If you don't know uh, who Wendell Berry is, there have been references to him in both the Konkin book uh, and in uh, Wurzba's book. Uh, and he's a fairly famous figure in the whole uh, broad food reform movement in America today. Uh, he's uh, a person who's lived and farmed in uh, Kentucky pretty much his entire life, uh, but he's also written uh, a lot of fiction. Uh, he's written poetry, and he's written a lot of essays and nonfiction on the topics of uh, not just agricultural reform, but also uh, issues about the way our society as a whole uh, operates and basically calls across all these different fields for a return to uh, a more local, rooted lifestyle. Uh, so he's not necessarily arguing, say, for example, for organic free-range eggs. Um, what he sees as most important is a change in lifestyle to one where there are real long-term roots in a local community uh, and real relationships, uh, and therefore uh, decreased emphasis on our kind of mobile, corporate, uh, economy-focused way of life. Uh, and when you read this essay, uh, what I would like you to notice, really, and the reason I chose uh, to have us read this essay, is that I think you can see in his description of his local community and how it has changed over the decades, you can see very concretely, uh, and I think in very uh, compelling imagery, uh, some of the principles we've been talking about. Things like participation, things like subsidiarity, things like stewardship. Uh, and you can see uh, both what they look like when they're present and also, perhaps more tellingly, in the essay you can see what it looks like when those things are absent. Uh, and I think one of the values, of course, of the arts in general or of a uh, creative artistic author like Barry, in this case he's not writing fiction, but he still has a very nice artistic uh, way of writing. He's able to paint a picture of a way of life and paint a picture of our current way of life that shows some of the values that are working there or some of the values that are missing there. And so I think that's uh, a very helpful part of uh, reading this essay. I think you can also see as you read through this, basically he's arguing in the essay that this loss of rootedness, this loss of tradition in local communities isn't just nostalgia. Right? Barry is a smart man, he's been doing this for decades, and he knows very well that when a lot of people hear these kinds of arguments, they just say, well, that's just, some people are old-fashioned and they, they think old times were better, but that's just nostalgia, it wasn't really better, it's not really any superior morally or theologically than any other way of life. Uh, and he's arguing that in fact there are real concrete measurable differences, and that this loss of uh, local communities and relationships uh, has real economic costs, it has real environmental costs, and it has real social costs in the breakdown of families and social traditions, which results in real economic costs uh, for all of us in supporting 
uh, broken families and children in difficult situations and all kinds of things like this. Um, he also points out, I think, uh, very importantly, that when you lose relationships, when you lose long-term committed communities, uh, what has to fill the void, right? When I can't um, trust that the eggs I'm getting are safe because I've known that farmer down the road for 20 years and getting my eggs from him forever, so did everybody else around here, we all like his eggs. Um, if the eggs are just showing up in a store somewhere in a styrofoam container and I have no idea where they came from, how can I be certain these eggs are safe? Well, the only way to know that without some sort of relationship or community tradition is to have uh, a governmental process. We need regulations. We need um, government monitoring. We need uh, FDA policies. And so basically, uh, what Barry is arguing is that we've uh, exchanged these rooted relationships and communities for lawyers and contracts and bureaucracy. Uh, and he uses the example of the school system to show this. Uh, but of course, I think the same thing is very true of the food system as well. Uh, and many people who uh, are calling for a transformation in agriculture uh, will continually complain about uh, how the government is always standing in the way, that it uh, prefers corporate operations, that all of the procedures and regulations that have been set up make it impossible for an honest, hardworking, clean, healthy, uh, small operator to sell their produce or to sell their eggs or milk. Uh, and there certainly is some bias uh, in the government towards the corporate models. Uh, but we also have to recognize that we as a people have brought that on ourselves uh, by choosing a lifestyle where we constantly move, where we don't have real connections with other people, where we rely on lawyers to settle our differences. Uh, the only possible way to organize life in that sort of situation is with lawyers, with contracts, with bureaucracy. Uh, so I think that's a, an important point that he raises. Uh, he ends the reading on a somewhat pessimistic or optimistic note, I suppose, depending on uh, the mood you're in in reading it. Uh, he does think that change is still possible, but he's very uh, skeptical that any sort of policy changes uh, can make a meaningful difference. Instead, what he argues needs to happen is a real kind of grassroots movement, uh, particularly starting in, in small rural uh, communities, but even on an individual basis, uh, that's how he sees things might actually begin to change. So I thought I'd have you read this because he, he expresses some of these principles we've been talking about, and I think he also does a very nice job of showing how when we lose relationships, we lose communities, uh, the government and the corporations and all that bureaucracy that uh, much of this course is criticizing, those come in to fill the vacuum uh, that we've created by giving up uh, the relationship and communities uh, in exchange for uh, our pursuit of modern American life. So once you've had a chance to read uh, Wurzba and to read Barry, I'd really like you to reflect on uh, the points they're making and then come to Blackboard uh, and discuss some of these ideas. Uh, and I think there are some important points that we can take from these uh, two authors together, together with uh, what we've covered up to this point in the class, uh, and to see that there really is a connection between the way we eat, the way we produce our foods, uh, and these changes in communities, these changes in the American lifestyle. That with revolution in agriculture, there's been this loss of rural communities, uh, and there's also been, uh, in general, uh, a breakdown in long-term social commitments uh, and relationships as American life has become much more transitory, much more mobile, uh, much more focused on pursuing the best paycheck, uh, the best uh, school zone, the best uh, whatever it might be, and that we've kind of taken it as a given now uh, that we move constantly and don't really uh, have any sort of commitment to a particular place. Uh, and what that has brought in, uh, as I think Barry shows, is uh, the bureaucracy and the legal uh, uh, red tape that we all complain about, but which really is the only possible solution 
uh, to dealing with problems in such a transitory uh, population. Uh, and again, this, none of this is to say that any of one of these particular choices is certainly immoral. Um, you know, it's not always wrong to eat alone. It's not always wrong uh, to just go buy some eggs at the store rather than go to the farmer's market. Um, and this is, again, part of what Catholic social teaching is about, right? Is to say that there can be lots of individual moral choices that on their own are perfectly acceptable. But when we put them all together to look at how they work as a system, the results are different. And the results can be um, bad, even though the individual choices may not be. And so what we as American people seem to have done uh, over the past decades is to consistently, or almost always, uh, choose the quick and easy and cheap option over the, the slower, uh, the perhaps more expensive, more meaningful uh, options available. And so that we basically, through the sum total of our choices, created this American way of life uh, that so many of us find problematic, at least uh, on some of these issues. Uh, but again, I think this ultimately raises a uh, big question that I'd like to ask you all and think have you consider uh, is, is this really a moral theological issue? Uh, is it really a more Christian way of life to be committed to a local community to uh, share family meals together uh, versus uh, often moving for better jobs or better schools um, versus uh, eating alone or eating fast food? Is that really just a difference in, in lifestyle preferences, or is it a real moral theological difference where you actually are a better person in some sense if you choose one way or the other? And again, uh, if we take seriously what uh, the Christian view of the human person is, uh, it seems to me at least plausible that there is a real uh, better choice there, and it's not just a matter of preference. But again, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, and then, to build on that, uh, if we do think some change is necessary, or even some significant change is necessary, uh, is it really realistic to expect that to happen on kind of the level of national policy or sort of legal reform or government programs? Uh, if this whole system is a result of people choosing uh, this kind of transitory lifestyle, um, and the government programs have arisen to kind of fill the void made by the loss of relationships, it doesn't really make any sense to expect government programs to undo this. Um, which also then raises the corresponding question of what sort of obligations do we have as individuals uh, to change this? Um, do we need to think about moving to take a new job? Do we need to think about uh, upgrading our house, which is going to be just moving across town, maybe. Uh, are those real moral and theological choices in a way that many Americans uh, don't think of them as being? Uh, so those are some of the questions I'd like to leave you with, and I'll, I'll pick one or two to ask you specifically about on Blackboard. But I would like your thoughts on this set of ideas as a whole, uh, because I think, uh, I would argue at least, that it is important, and that if we really want significant change in the way the American food system works, that's only going to be possible with a significant change in the way uh, we as American people choose to live. Uh, real significant change in agriculture would require uh, shifting back and putting a lot more people at work in agriculture, less technology, less chemicals. But that would mean uh, people moving less. That would mean people working less in other industries more of our time and resources being devoted to food and less to um, iPads and TV uh, and new cars. It would require a pretty big revolution in the way we live uh, and not just some minor reforms. But again, uh, I will love to hear your thoughts on Blackboard.